Imagine for a moment, a favorite coworker that you've worked with during your career. Today, I'm gonna to introduce you to mine. He's three years old. He has four legs and lots of yellow fur. My goal today is to expand your thoughts on some of the things conservation dogs are doing, what they are capable of, and how they may be useful for solving problems you encounter in integrated pest management. I'd like to begin with sharing details about my experience with rodent detection dogs in both structural pest management and island biosecurity. I will provide an overview of conservation detection dogs and share my thoughts on ways dogs can help solve complex problems in IPM. Dogs were first trained in the pest control industry to sniff out termites in 1979. At that time, bed bugs had largely er been eradicated due to widespread use of pesticides like DDT. However, new pesticide resistant strains of bed bugs made a resurgence in the early 2000s, particularly in densely populated cities. Since the old methods of killing bed bugs were no longer effective, exterminators were desperate to locate and control new infestations. In come bed bug detection dogs to help solve the problem. Bed bug detection dogs were first mentioned in the early 2000s. In the last decade, bed bug dogs have become an indispensable part of modern pest control, offering greater accuracy and efficiency at finding bed bugs compared to human inspectors. In the US, various people have worked with different terrier breed dogs to hunt rodents and help eradicate them, particularly in vermin infested alleys and garbage heaps in big cities. Over the past year, I have been exploring a different approach to utilizing rodent detection dogs in pest management. Unlike the previously mentioned dogs that were only hunting and killing rodents, my detection dog is specially trained to locate odors left behind by rodents. Getting rid of rodents inside structures or in outdoor landscapes is a comp complex problem globally. As humans, we must rely on our sight to identify evidence telling us where they are, how they're getting there, and where they're coming from. Another challenge we face as humans is we are often physically unable to fit in many of the small spaces where rodents frequent. Here's where we can tap into a dog's superpower, his extraordinary sense of smell. A rodent detection dog's keen sense of smell enables him to positively identify beyond what our human senses can offer. A dog, smell, a dog can smell odors that allow us to accurately locate rodent pathways, entry and exit points, nesting sites, burrows, and other high activity areas. Knowing this invisible information increases management accuracy and efficiency while decreasing the need for rodenticides. Before I explain more about the specifics of rodent detection dog capabilities, here's a video to briefly explain, explain some of the aspects of how a dog's nose works. To us? This is just a field, but to this dog, it's a portal through time. She can peer into the past, what happened an hour, even a week ago. Thanks to this exquisite olfactory device, Zinka is a search and rescue dog, a champion sniffer. Today, she's working with researchers from the University of California, Berkeley. Yes, she is. She's wearing a GPS device and other sensors so they can figure out how she tracks smells so well. Like from this hiker. Because tracking smells isn't like following a dotted line on a map. Odors don't spread out evenly. They're all swirly twisted around by air currents. But Zinka's nose can make sense of that. It's a precision instrument. 
Like us, dogs can tell if smells are coming from the left or right because their nasal passages are completely divided. But here's how Zinka totally outdoes us. When she sniffs in, most of the air goes into her lungs, but some of it splits off into a separate stream that goes into a special chamber called an olfactory recess. Inside, there's an intricate maze of little passages. Here's a researcher's scan of what it looks like in cross-section. All those twists and turns create a huge surface area, which hold more than half a billion sensory cells that feed information to the brain. That's 15 times more than we have. All of our sensory cells are in this little patch. And we don't have a special chamber for smelling. When Zinka exhales, the air is blasted out the side through those slits, so she can take in a fresh sample each time. First, she gets a sample, something the hiker is worn. Then she hits the trail, sniffing about five times per second. Zinka can pick up the tiny amounts of scent down to the molecules the hiker left behind that we would never notice. She can easily tell her apart from other humans as she finds her way through the maze of trails. right to the hiker. Good girl, Zinka. Close. Look, team, see what we're working on right now? Yay, Zinka. Now, I'd like you to meet my favorite co-worker, Canine JJ. JJ is my rodent detection dog, whom, I'm, whom I've conducted numerous searches with over the past year. His rodent detection training is based on methods I developed for conservation and biosecurity work. During the initial COVID lockdown, my overseas travel for developing biosecurity programs stopped, and I was stuck at home like the rest of us with more time to think than I knew what to do with. I wasn't the only one going stir crazy needing something to problem solve. My yellow lab JJ was fully trained on rodents and was eagerly awaiting his next deployment for biosecurity work on islands. Now, if any of you have experienced what living with a high drive working dog or a cubicle mate is like, you will understand why it was imperative for me to find immediate job for JJ. I began thinking of ways I could use his super nose and my knowledge on rodent ecology to help with rodent management in the US. My background in pest management was minimal, other than being terrified of cockroaches and sucking them up in the vacuum. And I wanted to learn more about the problems encountered with rodents in residential and commercial scenarios. I reached out to a local pest control company to share my thoughts on how dogs could provide valuable information to help us better understand rodent activity in and around structures. We decided to trial various uses of rodent detection dogs for the company's customers. As many of us here know, rodents navigate the world and communicate with each other primarily via olfaction. As they travel from point A to B, they are continually leaving behind odors, whether urine, gland secretions, feces, and or skin cells. These odors are most often invisible to us but they are like neon highway signs to a dog. What do all of these areas have in common? All of these areas will have higher concentrations of odor based on rodent activity. Dogs can work through varying levels of odor to locate these areas of high concentration. Knowing the location of these key areas will give inspectors the upper hand when developing a management strategy. Once we know how rodents are getting inside a structure, 
Those entry points can be properly excluded. Once we locate nest, they can be removed. Once we identify frequently traveled pathways, they can be managed. Once we identify areas with rodent damage, such as plumbing or ducting, they can be repaired. A little background before I play this video of JJ locating an entry point. The customer recently purchased the house and decided to raise it due to periodic flooding. Prior to purchasing and lifting the house, there were existing issues with rats in the attic. A local pest company deployed eight bait boxes around the home prior to construction. Rodent activity appeared to have ceased during construction. The homeowner began hearing scratching noises around three months after construction was completed. He contacted a second pest company. That company identified a few gaps around exterior pipes and excluded them with foam and mesh. They also deployed additional bait boxes around the home and in the attic. Another three months passed and the homeowner was still hearing scratching noises in the walls and seeing increased droppings in the attic. A dog search was requested to identify entry points. After a 20 minute search of this three story 3,800 square foot home, JJ identified two entry points about 15 feet apart. This is the view under the stairs where you just saw JJ indicating there was an area of high odor concentration. During the construction, the builders clearly forgot a piece of siding. This is the same view under the stairs. The homeowner placed a motion camera, uh, camera in view of the area after JJ identified it. Two days after our inspection, the camera captured this. This video is four days after the dog search. We can see a rat entering through the point JJ identified. This is a clip of JJ locating the second entry point at the same home. Just before I stop the, the video, um, watch where JJ's nose pinpoints. I'll play it again. Maybe. Right there. So uh, here's what JJ was showing us behind the siding. You can see the rodents have chewed out a crescent shaped portion of the backer board, creating an entry and exit point. Uh, let's look at another example from a different residential search. This customer had been dealing with mice issues for almost two years. He worked with two different pest companies that came out several times to do exclusion work at the ground and roof levels of his two-story home. The exclusion work was very thorough from a human standpoint. After a 20-minute search, JJ found two separate entry points. Pictured here is one of those entry points, which was a small gap where the concrete was deteriorating at the corner of a crawl space <laughs> vent. 
pictured here is another entry point or the other entry point at this home, which was at the bottom corner of the back exterior door. It's important to note that there were no visible holes or gaps from the outside of the house in this area. The only thing out of place was uh, the bottom piece of vinyl siding was not attached securely. Because I could not visualize any exterior holes or gaps in that area uh, without removing siding, we entered the crawl space to investigate this area from the interior. This video shows JJ identifying the same spot from the interior. At the end of the video, you can see JJ coming in for his well-deserved reward. Unlike most of us who work for bonuses, PTO, and 401ks, JJ happily works for a measly few pieces of kibble. Uh, after pulling down the interior insulation in the crawl space, you can see daylight coming through entry points from the outside. Here's a photo of where the rodents chewed and created an entry point in the rotted wood in the same area. We found many droppings in this area as well as tunnels into the insulation. Um, exclusion of this entry point included removing panels of the siding on the exterior to access the wood for repairs. Another customer was having ongoing rodent activity inside the crawl space and attic. Pest technicians conducted a visual inspection and were not able to locate any entry points. The technicians placed six bait boxes around the home. After a few months, the rodent activity had not stopped. A dog search was requested to identify entry points. This picture shows the area where JJ indicated that there was a higher amount of rodent odor. When I inspected the area, I noticed the vinyl siding was detached in this section and I could feel a gap on top of the brick when I reached under the siding. This photo is the view of the same section from the crawl space. You can see the gap where the wall doesn't meet the foundation. This is a video uh, from a rodent search last week. The manager of this apartment duplex uh, had been receiving complaints about rodent activity inside the walls for the past year. She worked with two different pest companies to manage the problem. When I arrived, there were 10 bait boxes around the approximately 2,500 square foot building. I saw foam exclusion in all the gaps around plumbing and wires. The crawl space vents were newer and completely sealed. From a visual perspective, all possible entry areas appeared to be sealed up. After a five minute search with JJ, he identified two entry points. This picture shows the underside view of where JJ indicated. There was water damage to the wood from the leaking pipes here, but the rats had chewed the backer board again to gain access or easier access into the crawl space. This video is of JJ locating the second entry point at the same building, which were approximately three feet from the HVAC unit.
This is the photo of the entry point on the bottom stair. And this picture shows the second entry point on the second stair. This is a summary of feedback I received from the pest control company owner regarding the benefits of rodent detection dog searches we conducted. We searched 90 structures over the last year and the company has seen 75% reduction in use of product due to the dog identifying where activity is versus having a technician's best guess and placing multiple bait boxes out. A 90% reduction in repeat visits. Once entry points are excluded, management is more effective and activity inside the structure stops. Customers can watch the dog work, and even though they may not understand everything the dog is doing, they see areas where he investigates and identifies activity, which gives them tangible evidence and greater peace of mind. The public outreach aspect of having a dog is a unique way to connect people and explain integrated pest management. Customers often have positive perceptions about the value of detection dogs, such as in police, narcotics, and explosives work. And we now have increased ability to stop rodent activity in its early stages. The dog's abilities allow us to identify what is happening on the first visit, even if it's one rodent and there is no visual evidence. We can have a high confidence that all entry points have been identified and will be excluded. Now, I uh, will share a little about my background and how I became involved with rodents and dogs in the field of conservation and biosecurity. This picture shows me many haircuts ago. In November 2017, the government of South Georgia wanted to establish a rodent detection dog program based in the Falkland Islands. This program would be the first of its kind in the world, so there were many unknown questions to answer. The purpose of developing this novel program was to protect the wildlife of South Georgia from rodents. South Georgia is a sub-Antarctic UK overseas territory and home to the world's most important seabird breeding areas, 2 million fur seals, and 50% of the world's population of southern elephant seals. It is also home to the world's southernmost endemic songbird, the South Georgia Pipit. For reference, the Falkland Islands are pictured at the top of this slide. Uh, to the southeast of the Falklands is South Georgia. To the west of the Falklands is the southern tip of South America. From the early 1900s to 1966, South Georgia was a hub for the sealing and whaling industry. During this time, visiting vessels inadvertently brought with them a whole range of species, including rats and mice, which with an abundance of food and no natural predators, very soon became highly invasive. The rats wreaked havoc on the ecosystem to include predating on the ground nesting birds. The world's largest rodent eradication campaign started in 2011. After over $12 million and seven years of challenging work, South Georgia was declared rodent free in 2018. In order to keep South Georgia rodent free and its ecosystem thriving, no rodents can ever hitchhike there again on a vessel. This is where the need to develop a rodent detection dog program comes in. The rodent detection dog program's mission was to successfully train dogs to detect presence of rodents on vessels. Dog teams inspect every vessel heading to South Georgia waters at their last port in the Falkland Islands. Imagine being the human responsible for conducting an inspection for rodent sign on a vessel this size with 100% confidence. I'd say finding a needle in a haystack is an understatement. Large vessels are vast areas 
full of physically challenging obstacles to navigate and search, especially when looking for a single rat or mouse stowaway. If you've never been aboard a large vessel such as this, it's got more nooks and crannies than a Thomas's English muffin. Accomplishing this task without a dog would be impossible. I was the lucky person to lead and develop all aspects of this program over the course of three years. We learned more than ever imagined about rodent behavior and what the dogs could tell us. All of this information was essential to guide the development of dog training protocols and methodologies. We discovered an interesting fact this past year when the dog team visited South Georgia. Depending on odor concentration level, substrate, and environmental conditions, rodent odor is detectable up to 10 years after presence. The detection dogs have shown us that uh, rodents often investigate bait boxes, but are reluctant to enter them. This information is supported and confirmed by research. Because rodents frequent ports and warehouses, residual odor from their urine is often found on many items such as provision boxes and other various equipment and materials. The dogs are trained and learn how to process and ignore these residual odors in order to locate odor that is consistent with active rodent presence. Rodent management at maritime ports around the world could have a much greater impact than is currently realized. The global cost of invasive alien species have been estimated around 350 billion. Breaches of biosecurity leading to incursions by invasive species have the potential to cause substantial social, environmental, and economical losses. Integrated pest management is an enrichment of diversity in managing invasive and other pest species and offers the best opportunity to address problems such as these in biosecurity. Conservation detection dogs were first utilized to detect the kiwi bird in New Zealand since the late 1800s. The uses of conservation detection dogs has expanded to include the detection of live wildlife, carcass detection, detection of scats, pathogens, and biological materials, and detection of plants, aquatic species, and invertebrates. Every target scat a dog finds is like gold to researchers. The location and quantities of the scat helps researchers better understand population densities and habitat data. DNA tests on scats can identify individual animals, evaluate diet, hormone levels, pregnancy rates, stress signals, and disease. Toxicology tests on scat reveal levels of contaminants that the animals have been exposed to. A dog sees the world through its nose. The dog's sense of smell is at least 100,000 times more sensitive than ours. Humans have around 6 million scent receptors. Dogs possess up to 300 million. They can detect a single teaspoon of sugar in a million gallons of water, which is enough to fill two Olympic-sized swimming pools. These skills mean that dogs can find targets up to 40 times faster than human search teams and with near perfect accuracy. Human searches are often biased towards adult and territorial animals, but dogs find scats from all individuals, including juveniles and subordinates, giving better data and more accurate population and distribution estimates. Dogs are also capable of working in any environment. They can cover large areas and rough terrain while detecting cryptic species and scents hid hidden in deep vegetation. 
and they do it with virtually virtually limitless eagerness and energy. At every stage of prevention, management, and eradication of invasive species, dogs have a role to play. Dogs can be trained to identify multiple species at a time with no reduction in efficacy. Their ability to search multiple targets simultaneously can expand their scope of work, allowing stakeholders to pool resources and strengthen collaborative efforts. Dogs have demonstrated the ability to discriminate the scat of disease-infected animals from uninfected individuals of the same species. Dog-based monitoring is far less expensive and much faster than traditional methods for monitoring disease in free-ranging wildlife. Here's a list of some of the targets that conservations, uh, conservation dogs have worked on globally. I've missed many of the targets uh, on this list. More targets are continually emerging every year. Dogs' potential to find conservation targets is seemingly endless. Invasive plants cost billions every year. Catching them before they spread is vital to effective management and eradication. Humans often cannot spot invasive plants until after they have taken over. Dogs can detect the first infestation or alerting ecologists to noxious weeds before they choke the native e ecosystem. Dogs can identify the first colonist or last survivors of a plant population that has resisted chemical treatment. Dyer's Woad paves over landscapes with its tall yellow flowers. It has displaced numerous native plants. Each woad produces around 400 seeds but can generate up to 10,000 per plant. Its spread is inevitable unless plants are located and removed before they reproduce. Human searchers pulled woad for 10 years without making a dent in its population. Detection dogs got involved and were able to locate woads at all reproductive stages, even those invisible to the human eye. Dogs are impressively capable of locating remnant roots before they emerge from the ground. By finding resprouting seedlings, seedlings still underground, dogs helped weed managers realize that pulling was insufficient, so removal methods, methods were improved. These maps show Mount Sentinel in Missoula, Montana, covering about 200 acres. Over about a decade of annual surveys, Conservation dog teams managed to contain the woad population to just a few sectors and map out the likely location of remnant seed banks and root systems to respond accordingly. What does contain mean? When the dog team started, they might find and pull 600 plus rosettes per year, a significant proportion being mature plants and the flowering and seeding phase. In the last five or so years, the teams have shifted to finding in the tens and twenties range, sometimes in the fives, across the entire season. The plant almost never, the plants almost never reach the dreaded flowering or seeding stage anymore. They've also moved from multiple dog teams and human only teams to a solo dog team being the primary means of monitoring. Here's a video of a conservation detection dog searching and locating a tiny world milkweed in a sea of green.
Wait. Milkweed. My goodness, it's a small one. A couple more. Yes. Good girl. Good girl, Lily Lou. Yay! Yay, Miss Will! Pictured here from left to right is uh, bush clover and world milk milkweed. When you're looking for tiny rosettes in a sea of vegetation, a dog is a really powerful assistant. The emerald ash borer is an Asian species of beetle that was discovered in Mission in Ontario in 2002. Able to infect every species of ash tree in North America, the beetle has the potential to cause enormous damage since most trees die within two to four years of becoming infected. To date, the beetle has killed over 50 million trees in the U.S. alone. Dogs have been trained to detect emerald ash borer infested wood. Tree care professionals, arborists, and homeowners all have a vested interest in the fight against emerald ash borer. What specific odors dogs are trained on differs for all types of tree pest. For example, with the spruce bark beetle, they are trained on beetle pheromones. Asian longhorn beetle, they're trained on frass. Asian longhorn beetles produce a lot of frass. Southern pine decline is beetle associated, but the dogs are trained on two types of fungi. Some conservation targets are tiny, with correspondingly tiny scent cone, which may require the dog to work with their nose pressed to the ground on leash and very diligently cover a tiny area of ground, such as the rosy wolf snail in Hawaii. To prevent introduction of invasive mussels into uninfested water bodies, conservation detection dogs help inspect watercraft at numerous locations in the US and Canada. Zebra and quagga mussels have caused billions of dollars of damage to invade to by invading lakes, taking over ecosystems and clogging the pipes that deliver water to communities, power plants, and sewage treatment facilities. They have not yet colonized the waters of many of our national parks like Yellowstone, Glacier, and Grand Teton. Dogs are most helpful when identifying microscopic larvae, which can invade lakes just as effectively as adults. Using dogs to find feces of sentinel species like otter and mink has proven to be a great application the non-invasiveness of this method helps monitor exposure in real time rather than opportunistically surveying carcasses or roadkill. Mink and otter are elusive and notoriously hard to capture for blood sampling. So scat surveys can be a great tool for environmental contaminants monitoring. Dogs are trained to find the scat of a target species, not contaminants, as one might think could be a more efficient use. Having the dogs find the scat allows researchers to gain a fuller sense of what is happening in the landscape, removes the element of bias that the surveyed landscape is or is not contaminated, and offers more opportunities for reward for the dogs. Conservation detection dogs require specific characteristics and aptitude for the job. This is not a job for any dog. 
Many conservation detection dogs are sourced from shelters. As few as one in 200, one in 300 shelter dogs are likely to have the necessary traits. Of these, roughly 40% complete the training program after selection. And their accuracy and effectiveness depend on the quality of handler training and require continual training annually to evaluate proficiency. Over the next several months, I plan to explore opportunities where dogs can help identify active rodent burrows in open landscape areas, such as parks and farms. I anticipate that dogs will increase our accuracy and efficiency by increasing the number we find with less manpower. I envision dogs will provide a greater assurance that burrows occupied by rodents are occupied by rodents and eliminate burrows that are similar in appearance but occupied by other residents. Conservation detection dogs have already been utilized to locate active burrows of many other species to include rodents around the world. Future of dogs and IPM. Can the use of rodent detection dogs improve how we manage rodents? and drastically reduce the routine use of pesticides? Would conservation dogs serve IPM principles to manage pest damage by, most, by the most economical means and with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment? Can the use of conservation detection dogs provide invaluable information in a four-tiered IPM implementation approach? Identify and monitor pests, set action thresholds, prevent and control. My answer is an unequivocal yes. We know dogs as detection tools are successfully utilized in many disciplines all over the world. I see enormous potential to expand the use of detection dogs for rodent detection and other species detection within IPM industry. I believe this is a new environmentally conscious approach that will provide a sustainable resource to solve challenging problems, better guide management practices, and provide new valuable information about the ecology of pest species. We all love dogs, and you're probably thinking how lucky I am to have such an amazing four legged coworker. But my true passion is exploring the ways dogs can help us humans better our world. If anything I've covered has even slightly sparked your interest in conservation dogs and how they can support IPM, I'm always available for a call, a text, or email.